Hi, I'm Conor Houghton, and this is Lecture 9 in the Information Theory section of our unit in Information Processing in the Brain. And today I'm going to be talking about the mutual information or for continuous probabilities. In fact, most of the lecture will be about uh, the differential entropy. Uh, I'll explain how the differential entropy changes in a change of variable. And that will allow us to see that the definition of the mutual information is nice in a way that the uh, definition of the differential entropy is inconvenient. So the main uh, issue today, and, and we'll return to this in the um, Inframax uh, lectures, uh, the main issue is that the probability density uh, isn't just a function. It has very specific transformation properties. The transformation properties it has makes it a density. Densities are just like uh, the densities for, um, for matter, for the thing that you integrate to get mass. As, as a quick example, this is Stretch Armstrong. It was a toy that was uh, popular when I was uh, a boy. Uh, it was a figure about uh, this high, well, I mean, I'm not sure, because um, I was small then, but it was it was a substantial uh, action figure with these uh, these uh, quite uh, brief briefs, uh, quite a big build, and this, uh, this very uh, square head. And the main thing about uh, Stretch Armstrong was he was made of, uh, I guess, a heavy latex material with some sort of horrible soft gooey stuff inside and after you played with them a bit the, the gooey stuff would leak out you were supposed to put them in the, free, in the freezer to be um, repaired at some later dates and most stretch armstrongs are still there in, in freezers waiting their release from cryonic suspension but anyway the main point was you could stretch him and this was the point of the toy so you and your friend would pull in his arms and he could become uh, i mean this isn't an extreme example he could become qu quite quite large you could also hammer on his chest to make his chest flat uh, enough about uh, Stretch Armstrong. The main point is that if I wanted to make a function of the um, density or the sorry, the, the mass of the uh, Stretch Armstrong's arm uh, per length, it might look a little bit like this. Obviously, this is uh, grossly simplified because there's more more mass here than here. But let's just imagine it. It was a constant thickness, and this is Stretch Armstrong's uh, arm, and this is the mass per length of Stretch Armstrong's arm. Now, when we stretch it. Um, the, the amount of mass in Stretch Armstrong's arm stays the same. So you, you're not increasing the amount of Stretch Armstrong, uh, you're, just, you're just stretching it, uh, as the name suggests. And so in this stretch version, if this, this is the same uh, function, mapping the uh, mass per unit length of Stretch Armstrong's uh, arm, but you see that in addition to uh, getting longer, it also has to get shorter uh, or, or not as high uh, because the, the stuff, the gluten stuff, has been stretched out. And that's the, the behavior of a density. The, there are functions that are um, under the service of a conservation law. The amount of uh, mass in Stretch Armstrong's arm must stay the same. So as you stretch it, the function that gives you the, the mass per unit length, uh, well, that, that, that has to not just stretch, but also uh, change its height, change its profile, to take into account the fact that as you're stretching it, you're keeping the, the amount of mass the same. So let's look at that in the, in the specific case of, of probability densities. Uh, many of you have seen this before, but uh, it's useful to rehearse it because it's an important uh, point. So here we have the definition of the probability density, uh, of the purpose of the probability density. Here's the probability density. You integrate it over some interval, and that's giving you the probability that the uh, result will lie in that interval. So this is the probability here that x will be between z x0 and x1, and we get that by integrating the probability density from x0 to x1. And what we're going to do now is we're going to have a change of variable. So there'll be a new variable, y, uh, which we can write as a function of x. And so, you know, in its very simplest, y would be equal to a times x, or it could be the log of x, or, or whatever. Uh, we're going to do a change of variable. Just to, to remove any, any subtle issues, and these are subtle issues that, of course, can be uh, dealt with um, if, if you're careful and, and don't change the overall um, moral of the story. But to, to stay away from all of that, we're just going to assume the change of variable is this nice one. So uh, x is a monotonic uh, uh, function of, sorry, y is a monotonic function of x. So you don't have the difficulty where two values of x match to the same value of y. And so it's easy to invert the function. As I said, if, if that's not the case for change of variables, you just have to be careful and change the integrals accordingly, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the, the moral stays the same, but we're going to deal with the, the simple case here. So in the simple case, we have a new variable y. It's a function of x. As like I said, you could have uh, y equals 3 times x, or y equals a half of x, or y equals the log of x. Or if x was strictly positive, you could have y is equal to x squared, or, or whatever. And x would also have to be strictly positive in the, in the log case. OK, so let's do that change of variables. Now, the thing to remember when you do a change of variables is uh, there's two parts to it. If you're doing a change of variables in an integral, you have to change well, the first part is this Jacobian factor. You have to do a change of variables on the on, on, on this thing here, on the uh, differential increment, the uh, dx, 
uh, going to dy, dx is equal to dx dy by dy. That's because this dx corresponds to the you know, infinitesimal limit of these little delta x's that you're summing in the, in the Riemann integral. And of course, if you're changing variable, those little delta x's are changing lengths. And so there's a different amount of stuff going into each part of the sum. And you have to take that into account, or that is taken into account, by the Jacobian. So the dx is the, the sort of ruler that you're measuring with. If you're changing variables, you have to change that. Okay, and now uh, that's the first part. The second part, of course, is you have to change the function. So the function now must be expressed as a function of y. And there's nothing sort of subtle here. You just have a function. Uh, this was px of x, the function we had before. But now uh, we're integrating over y, so we have to make that a function of y. And we can do that because x is, is, is expressible as a function of y. That's uh, the part of the change of variables. And in fact, we've guaranteed that it's a straightforward matter because we've asked that y is uh, uh, monotonic. So uh, this is just a little picture. Here we have the, um, the curve. This is representing px of x. Uh, here's the x variable along here. Now we have this new axis y is representing so the, the new variable. So y, there's a particular value of y will correspond to a, to a particular value of x. That's the change of variable. And to work out the value uh, px of x of y, you go from y to x, and then there's a value of x is, uh, of p of x of associated with it. So there's, th this bit is, uh, the thing that we do without thinking if we change variables in a function. We, we take the old variable and we write it in terms of the new one. But the point is that uh, the, this thing now should be a probability density in terms of y. So this is um, p, the probability that y will lie in the interval of y0 to y1. That's just given by the integral from y0 to y1 of the y density p y of y dy. And the probability to, shouldn't change if you do a change of variables. We're still talking about the same um, process. The probability uh, that uh, uh, y will lie in some interval x0 to, to x1 should be the same as the probability that y will lie in the interval y0 to y1 if y0 corresponds to x0 and y1 corresponds to x1. So we haven't changed the process, we've just changed the labels we've used for the outcomes. We've just changed the variable that we use to describe uh, the outcome uh, and in doing so we've gone from the random variable x for the x variable to the random variable y for the y variable. Probability should stay the same. And so that, of course, uh, because um, uh, because we know what p y of y is, uh, p, uh, so we know what this, this probability is in terms of y, we now get an equation, and it looks something like this, that the integral p y of y dy should be equal to, and this is the thing we worked out by our explicit change of variables, p x of x of y dy dx. And so now you see that, uh, obviously, this is true for all, all intervals y0 to y1, and if it's true for all zeros, uh, intervals uh, y0 to y1, and assuming various well-behavedness properties of the functions that we're dealing with, then the integrands must be the same, at least up to a set of measure zero, I guess. Uh, and so that tells us that the new uh, probability density, after we've changed the variables, is the old probability density expressed in terms of the new variable, the usual thing we do with functions changing variables, and this extra factor, uh, the Jacobian factor, which takes into account the change in the, from dx to dy. And so that's the extra bit uh, that uh, transforms the function, that does the transformation we saw in the case of stretch Armstrong's arm, of changing the tall function to the, uh, to the thin one as we stretched the, uh, the, the x-axis. This change of variables corresponds to um, stretching the arm. Uh, and th th that transformation uh, is taken into account by this thing here. And so that's the property that comes from basically the conservation law, that we have this idea that we have in the new variables, we have something um, that, uh, that stays the same, and we want to dis the object described in the new variable in terms of the object, the density described in the new variable in terms of the density described in the old variable, with the knowledge that the relationship between those densities is that uh, they must describe um, this probability bass, which is preserved across the change of variables. Uh, and so this, uh, this formula then, uh, the change, uh, the formula for, the ch for how you deal with the density, a probability density under change of variables, that's basically the definition uh, of a density. That's a, an object, a function that obeys this transformation law that we refer to as a density. And the interesting thing, of course, is that if we put that into the definition of the differential entropy, uh, the P of X changes, um, the, the, the P of X also occurs in the log. And so we, when we put the change of variables here um, into the definition of the differential entropy, we get this extra factor, which is basically when we have the log of this term here, that gets split into 
these two terms because of the, the way that logs change multiples into, uh, into additions. And we have this extra term here uh, coming out. And so that's the, um, that's the transformation property of the, um, of, the, of the differential entropy under a change of variables. And you can sort of have two attitudes to this. One is, you know, we have an object based on um, differential, uh, on, on, on a continuous probability. And obviously, a continuous probability, uh, you can do a change of variables. And so it's good that you could know how the object uh, changes. Another sort of um, attitude would be that this is, this is bad. We have a differential entropy. It's supposed to tell us something fundamental about the probability distribution. But it, it tells us something fundamental about the probability distribution as described by a particular variable. We might have this sort of um, platonic view of the probability distribution that it doesn't matter what the, the variables are, it's still describing the same thing. Um, but if it's describing the same thing, uh, maybe you'd like properties like entropy to be invariant, but they're not. The uh, differential entropy uh, is a property of Px of x. If you do a change of variables, Px of x changes uh, to, you know, y of y with this Jacobian factor in that relate in the relationship between them and when that happens the formula the value of the differential entropy uh, changes so that's the the main thing I wanted uh, to discuss today which was the the way that the differential entropy changes under a change of variables um, now I'm going to oh sorry just to, to, to give it a quick example if y is equal to a times x in other words a pure scaling um, relationship between them uh, then that dy dx just becomes a and we get this formula here and we saw this formula in action uh, when we worked out the um, well we saw it in action uh, several times if you look at the relationship between uh, the, the the well uh, most obviously uh, if you take the uh, uh, the uniform distribution and you do a scaling trans uh, transformation then you'll uh, find you get the log a that occurs in the uniform distribution because the h of x for the um, uniform distribution with width 1 uh, has entropy uh, 0. Good. Now let's think a little bit about the mutual information. The obvious formula for the mutual information would be to take the mutual information formula we had before, uh, i of x comma y is equal to h of x plus h of y minus h of x comma y, where you know, before those were big h's, Shannon's entropy. We had some nice intuition that that is a way of measuring the overlap between the information in x and the information in y. Well, let's just replace the big H's by little H's and hope that that gives us the mutual information for the uh, continuous probability uh, distribution. And uh, the second formula is just if you put, if you write out these definitions, uh, you come up with, with this formula here. And it is, again, uh, very similar to the formula we had before. Apologies for the lack of the dx dy. Um, but with the, uh, the probabilities replaced by densities. Now, the main thing is, uh, that, uh, and we're not going to go through this because we've only looked at change of variables in one dimension, but that change of variables can be done in more than one dimension. And what you can see is that you have, um, a, well, hopefully you'll see potentially that you have a cancellation. That if you change this ver this x here, this h of x will give you a log by the Jacobian factor. And if you change the x in uh, the joint distribution, um, and here we're just leaving the y alone, well then again you'll have a Jacobian factor related to the change of variable in x. And so this log, uh, this, 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 this here, the expectation value of the log of the Jacobian, this occurs twice, uh, once here with a plus sign and once here with a negative sign. I haven't uh, proved that, but you can see it's plausibly true. This h of x, the problem is, under change variables, it produces this integral uh, over the um, log, basically, of the Jacobian, or the ex mean expected value of the log of the Jacobian. This one, with the x there, <coughs> you can see that the that uh, um, hopefully it seems plausibly true, and it is true, that that will produce the same factor, and these two things will cancel. And so what uh, we learn is that the, uh, the mutual information uh, does not uh, change under a change of variable. And so, again, if we take this uh, sort of platonic view that, the, uh, that we don't really care about the variables, and so we're looking at the, if we want an intrinsic property of the distributions, the property that we should find uh, should be, or we should, would want, would be invariant under change of variables. And the mutual information has this property. And so uh, that makes us think that the mutual information is uh, the important quantity when dealing with uh, continuous 
uh, distributions. And we did motivate that uh, a couple of lectures ago at the start by pointing out that the, by looking at the continuous distribution, you can model the distribution or the noise in the receiver as well as the um, noise in the signal. And you can think of the information as having something to do with how you put one inside the other, how many times you can fit one inside the other. Um, so just to sort of wrap up here, uh, it, it, the mutual information has other nice properties. If we went through the same calculation we did uh, for the um, differential entropy, or rather if we took the, the, for the calculation we did for the differential entropy, which is really in some way encoding the change of variables calculation we did, uh, you'd find that um, if you discretize the x and discretize the y, as we had done before, uh, then, so this is the dec discrete entropy on the discretized distributions, uh, if we went through that, we'd find that it approaches the uh, the differential entropy, the mutual information for con continuous probabilities. So unlike the um, relationship between the Shannon's entropy and the differential entropy, where we were getting these extra factors, this extra factor of the width of the discretization coming out at the end, those widths cancel in the same way as I just pointed out, the Jacobians would cancel. And, and, and hence, and as I said, they're basically for the same reason. And hence, the mutual information uh, for um, continuous uh, probabilities we can think of as being the same object as the mutual information um, for discrete probabilities because uh, if you discretize a continuous probability then uh, the limit of that as the discretization width goes to zero is the, the mutual information for the continuous probability so before we have to be careful and you know have say that we have an object that's almost the same Shannon's entropy and differential ent entropy but they're not actually the same because one isn't the limit of the other but here they, they are the same in that sense the the limit of the uh, discrete mutual information for the discretization of a continuous distribution is the uh, mutual information of the continuous distribution. And as you might hope, um, as part of that, the, uh, the mutual information, this object in the, uh, that's defined on the continuous distributions, uh, is positive definite, uh, or is positive, it's, it's not negative. It has the same, it has many of the same nice properties that we observed the mutual information had uh, before. For the uh, for the discrete case, so again, the mutual information uh, i uh, comma y uh, is is positive uh, with equality uh, if and only if x and y are independent. Where you have to caveat the independence a little bit by saying on sets of measure zero and so on. You have the, the usual site subtleties that always occur when you're dealing with um, continuous probability because you're dealing with uh, integrals rather than uh, the objects themselves. But either way. The, uh, the, the main game in town, uh, I think, when we're dealing with continuous uh, probability distributions, is the mutual information. And um, just as I, as I mentioned before, and I mentioned uh, earlier as well, in fact, the, the, you know, our trust in the Shannon's entropy came from its relationship with source coding, with the source coding theorem, the idea that it was a way of tracking the amount of information in a signal because uh, it, was the, uh, it gave the bound of the word length required to describe that, that uh, the outcome of the experiment described by the random variable. Uh, that uh, coding theorem doesn't exist for the, uh, uh, the differential entropy, as we discussed, but there is an analog, which is uh, a theory of communication based on uh, continuous variables uh, and uh, noisy receivers. That's channel capacity theory. Uh, it is the um, continuous version, in a sense, or the reason why we, uh, a reason to think that the uh, the continuous the differential entropy is, is modeling what we wanted to model. But that, that theory, channel capacity theory, is about mutual information rather than about differential entropy. So uh, I'll stop there.